by Domenico. Uh, you, are you ready? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay, just another minute or so. It's people are just coming in. Of course. Listen, I'm, I'm really, really sorry I'm not there. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, if this helps, I, I actually, yes, I, I did spend six hours in an airport, four hours inside the plane, and I slept in an airport hotel. <laughs> And then you eventually still I gave up. Talk? Wow. <laughs> well, the thing is that eventually I had to give up this morning because the, the, they had nothing for me. And uh, the only flight would have arrived roughly now. Okay. So. <laughs> well, we're, we're grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but but I re I'm really, really sorry. I mean, uh, I, I seriously would have loved to come and, and discuss with you, you and you guys. I mean, really. Okay. Well. All right. We're ready to go. So, Absolutely. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, we're very glad to have Domenico Lenner, who's been through quite an ordeal to get to this point. So, we're glad to be able to at least hear him uh, virtually. And we'll just uh, look forward to the time when we can have these discussions in person. So, Domenico, take it away. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I really, I'm sorry, I need to apologize because I'm not there physically. I mean, I, as I was saying before, it's not for lack of trying, at least. Thing is, uh, I, I did spend a ridiculous amount of time in an airport, and I, um, but nothing was possible. Anyway, uh, today what I would like to, uh, to tell you about is some work that I've been doing together with my collaborators for quite some time, and it's related to what we call the dark charge expansion. And uh, well, given this meeting, it's, I stress a bit what we can learn from resurgence on large charge expansion and maybe what we can uh, learn about resurgence from large charge expansion. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you know, my collaborators. Uh, as you see, it's, we, we pretty much delocalized, which makes for some very interesting Zoom calls sometimes. And uh, well, I, just in geographical order, this is Ian Swanson, Luis Alvarez Gomez, Shailesh Chantasekaran, uh, Masataka Watanabe, Francesco Sannino, uh, Susanne Reffert, Nicola Dondi, and uh, this is the group of Susanne in Bern. Uh, this is uh, the Bashish Panerji, and uh, this is Simon Hellerman. And uh, we're people with quite different kind of uh, expertise, which turns out to be very useful in, in, the, in this job. And the point is, the kind of theories we've been until now discussing when uh, studying large charge expansion are conformal field theories. So uh, why look at conformal field theories? Well, you know, the one point is if you study quantum field theory in general, sooner or later, you're gonna end up in a CFT. Well, the reason being that generically, uh, the fixed point, the extreme on energy flow are CFTs, okay? And in fact, apart, one can also say that it, they are important just because you want to do real physics, okay? So in particular, you want to study critical phenomena, you end up discussing CFTs. And in particular, this is a frame that I took from a video you find on YouTube about the, uh, the funny properties of helium-4 at the superfluid point, where <clears throat> there are all sorts of nice things with the fountains of helium and uh, effects due to the fact that all of a sudden, it behave, doesn't behave like a normal fluid, okay? On top of that, we know that the only handle that we really have on quantum gravity in this moment, where we can actually do computations, is a DSCFT. So in practice, again, we only understand quantum, quantum gravity when it is a, a conformal field theory. And uh, well, I, I'm a string theorist, uh, at least I started my theory and my career as a string theorist. And, uh, you know, as a string theorist, you're very well aware that all the magic of string theory eventually boils down to the fact that you're secretly discussing a two dimensional conformal field theory. Anyway, today I will not be talking about this as these aspects of CFT, so there will be no strings, there will be no quantum gravity, but it's gonna be more critical phenomena and RG flows, okay? So 
okay, these are CFTs and they're very interesting. We want to study them. So why don't we all study CFTs? Why don't we solve CFTs all the time? Well, the problem is that CFTs are hard. And they're hard in a very technical sense. The point is that it, since they live at the end of RG flows, generically, these are strongly coupled theories. And the strongly coupled, uh, as you all know, is just a way of saying we don't know what to do with them. You see, ideally, you would want to have some nice limit where things become solvable. But in a strongly coupled theory, this you cannot do. Okay, so it's by definition strongly coupled just means I don't know what to do. Okay, now our idea is very simple. The idea is that if you have a CFT that on top of being a CFT also has some global symmetry, what you can do is that you can study your, your theory sector by sector, by which I mean the fact that there is a symmetry means that your Hebrew space decomposes into sectors of fixed charge. And uh, maybe, if you're lucky, and you look at these sectors separately, you can find a way of simplifying the computations that, in the case of the FT, in practice, means computing anomalous dimensions and the OPE coefficients. For the fact that the structure of the FT is such that once you know these quantities, you know everything. Okay? So if you want to just get an I one idea to, to bring home today is the fact that we study subsectors of the theory of fixed quantum number, which we'll call Q. And in each sector, what happens is that if Q is large enough, this behaves like a controlling parameter for a perturbative expansion, even though your initial theory is not perturbative at all. OK? So OK, there's a lot of words, but concretely, what can we do? So today, I will concentrate on uh, the ON model. It's the ON vector model in three dimensions, which is the, essentially the first example of conformity theory that we usually study. And uh, from the work of Wilson and Fisher, we know that this is the thing that in infrared is the, comfort, is the fixed point of phi to the fourth. OK? And in particular, one thing that we can compute is an explicit formula for the dimension of the lowest primary at fixed charge. Okay? And this formula takes this very simple form. It has uh, some coefficient C3 halves that intrinsically is something that we cannot get if not by comparing with other ways of computing these things, which concretely means lattice. But there's a here there is a precise power of the charge, which is three halves. And then there is an expansion. There's Q three halves, Q is one half. There is a number. And this number I can obviously compute. Here there should be dot, dot, dot. This is actually an irrational number. And then everything else becomes small when the charge becomes large. OK? So OK, this is a formula. And uh, of course, once you get your formula, that's a prediction. You, you want to compare it with something else. And here comes the problem. Generically, these things are really hard to compute. Uh, this is for the O2 model. Well, actually, it's true for any ON. But in particular, it's true for the O2 model in three dimensions, which means that it's not large n, because n is 2. It's not 4 minus epsilon, because epsilon would be 1. So concretely, oh, you could use bootstrap, of course. But bootstrap does not work for large charges for very precise technical reason. So concretely, the only way to verify if this formula makes sense or not yeah, is to go on to the lattice. So what we did is that we met some lattice people, the Shailesh and the Bashish that you've seen before. And these are extremely good lattice people. And they sat down, and they took the O2 model, they put it on the lattice, and they computed these conformal dimensions. And this is what they found. So the dots, where well, are these little squares here, these are the results on the lattice. And typically, I get asked the question, where are the error bars in here? And as I said, my, my collaborator is extremely good to the point that the error bars are less than a pixel in this picture. So you do see the error bars. And this continuous line is nothing else than this formula here, where we fitted these two numbers. OK, so the, the theory at least is predictive because you give me two numbers, you give me any two of these measurements here, and I give you all the rest. As you see, the agreement with the formula that we found is strangely good, I would say, to the point that the first time I've seen this plot, I, I just didn't believe it myself. OK, but I, I don't want to 
concentrate on this today because I want to talk about something slightly different. Nonetheless, I'd like to tell you how we got here in, in a couple of slides. So the first observation is the following, that it's a CFT, we want to compute conformal dimensions, but in CFTs, there's something called the state operator correspondence, which tells us that a CFT on R to the T is equivalent to a theory in R cross S to the D minus one, so on, on a cylinder, and the thing that here you call conformal dimension, which is the eigenvalue of the dilation operator, becomes just the energy because the radial direction in one frame becomes just the time direction in the other frame. So the eigenvalue of the uh, generator of time translations is just the energy, okay? So this means that once we put ourselves on a sphere, we just have to compute energies and these energies will be the conformal dimensions. Now, how do we compute these things? Well, we would like to write an effect, a Wilsonian effective action. And if you think when you, know, when you teach QFT, you say that the way of doing this is to choose a cutoff lambda, separate the fields into high and low frequencies, and integrate out the high frequencies, then you get an action for the low frequencies. And when you teach this, usually your students go like, yes, 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you feel a little, a little bit bad yourself, right? Because this is a lie. This is not something you can do. If you could do this, you just solve the theory, be done. So concretely, what do you actually do to write an effective, uh, an effective action? Well, you need to understand the physics, okay? So uh, to understand the physics, in practice, the first step is to understand what are the scales of your problem. And, and, and here you could be a bit worried because I said it's a CFT, so there should be no scales. And that's correct, and we're gonna use this a lot. However, you can put scales for one reason. One is that you can put your CFTs in a box. Now, it, it, does it really make sense? This is a bit of a tricky question in the sense that CFTs are in bar, well, at least the way I'm, I'm, uh, these CFTs I'm discussing are invariant and vile transformations, which means that you can always change the metric so that the box is not a box. But we know that we can pick a frame, so in particular the cylinder frame, and then your CFT really is living in this sphere, which let's say has a radius R. Now, this gives you one scale, and another scale is fixed by the charge, because if you pick a sector of fixed charge, this means there's gonna be a charge density, which is a dimension full object, which means that now you have a problem where even though the theory itself has no scales, now your problem does have scales, it has two scales in particular. It has one scale, which is the low energy scale, which is one over R, and another scale that is something you can control because you can decide what is the value of Q, and uh, you can pick it, well, if Q is, Q is in any case larger than one, but if you pick Q large enough, this becomes a high energy scale. And then by general arguments, essentially coming down to chiral perturbation theory, this means that if you write an action that w with the typical energy that is in between these two scales, by scale separation, if Q is large enough, you're gonna get an effective action which is weakly coupled and perturbative in the ratio between Q to the one half over R and one over R, which is essentially means, which essentially means that you have perturbative control as long as Q is large enough. So we now we have to write this action and to write the ac this action, we make the following observation. In a generic theory, and uh, quote unquote, uh, ask me if you want to know what generic means in this case. If I fix the charge with the state of lowest charge, well, of lowest energy with fixed charge, will break the symmetry and induce a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this is not a perturbative thing. This is just Goldstone's theorem, which means that uh, essentially, generically, the theory around that state must be described by one field, which is this Goldstone. And uh, then you use conformal invariant to write the most general action that is compatible with the symmetries and is written in terms of this Goldstone. And in three dimensions, this action takes this form. Now here, there's a funny power. You see there's there mu chi, the mu chi to the three halves. This is fixed by scale, by conformal invariance even. Ha and uh, you, you might be very worried about the three halves uh, because you think, okay, but how do I deal with the theory like that at all? Well, in, in fact, there is no problem because you must think of this theory always around a classical solution of fixed charge where chi is non-zero. So you're not quantizing this theory on zero, but you're quantizing this theory on mu t, 
where mu is some constant that depends on the charge. So when you expand this action, you get a normal quadratic action, you can quantize it and you can completely control it. The message being that the energy of the lowest state for this action here is precisely the conformal dimension of the lowest operator or given charge Q. That's the whole idea, okay? Now, one thing that I was already saying before, and I hope by the end of this talk, I will have convinced you that it makes a lot of sense, is the fact that um, presenting this thing, even the title of my talk says large charge, and uh, here I'm comparing with lattice, uh, and you see, uh, maybe 10 is large, who knows, but certainly two or one are not, la are not large. However, you see the continuous line, which is the one obtained in the large charge expansion, is strangely close to the result. So somehow this is a little bit too good to be true. Well, uh, for the moment, I just like to tell you that you shouldn't be terribly surprised by a thing like that, because there is another example where this happens, and this is called regio theory. Okay, so if you study re regio trajectories, what you find is that the prediction of the theory is a leading order prediction in the spin. Okay, with so the trajectory trajectories shouldn't be just linear in J, but they should have corrections. However, you go experimentally. This is a real plot, and these are these are really particles measured, and you see that they just come down linearly till one, till spin one. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it works so well that essentially people looked at these things and invented string theory just to justify where these things was working. So somehow, you know, a bit more generically, there's some sort of uh, unreasonable effectiveness of this uh, effective field theory story. Okay, so this is the end of my introduction, and uh, there's a slide. I, I'm going to discuss only the ON model, but this is just to tell you that there are many things that people have been doing and are doing uh, using this kind of approach, mainly based on the existence of effective field theory and fixing the charge, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of literature already and things that are really happening every day. However, just to, to recap a moment, what I've done here is that I've started from CFT, where there's no mass gap, no particles, no Lagrangian, picked a sector, and in this sector, the physics, the claim is that the physics is completely described by semi-classical configuration and little fluctuations on top. Uh, and Domenico, even though- Domenico, yes. can we interrupt you for a question? Of course, please? of course. Sorry. Please. So, Andy Nansky. Hi, Hi Andy. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. Oh, okay. Two questions, actually. So the first question was, on your plot where you had the fit and against the Monte Carlo data? Yeah. The fit, do I understand right, that was the explicit formula that you wrote before for the expansion starting with Q to the three halves? That's correct. So how many terms in that expansion did you use? Thank you for asking the question. Two, three actually, two or three. And by the end of the talk, I'll tell you why. Uh, at this point, it's just that we just tried with as many terms as we could, and we looked for which was the best fit. And the best fit is obtained, you, you know, there, there's this story of if you put too many, it gets too good, and so on. And the best fit is obtained between two and three terms. Okay, and the other question is, can you say again, is there a simple physical reason why the theory becomes weakly coupled at, at large charge? Of course. So the simple physical reason is the following. Uh, let me just go back a slide or two, uh, is this. So the point is, um, now you fix the charge, okay? So uh, if you fix the charge generically again, there's gonna be a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking for the simple reason that the state of lowest charge is not invariant under the, under the transformation, of course, okay? So what you expect is that your physics is described by a Goldstone field around whatever is this solution. Okay with that? Okay. Good. Now, you have to think of this effective field theory really in the same terms, sorry, I was trying to go back, really in the same terms as when you think of kind of perturbation theory. You have one low energy scale, which in this case is the size of the sphere or the cylinder, and one high energy scale, which is uh, the charge density. Now, generically, what happens is that if you write an effective field, th an effective field theory, with four energies in between these two, there is automatically the uh, 
uh, controlling parameter of the, perturbative correct, of the perturbative expansion that is given by the ratio between the high energy scale and the low energy scale. This is pion physics. This is literally pion physics. Okay? Okay. Now, are you okay with that? Yeah, yes, yes, thanks. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, if there are other questions, it's a great moment. Huh? Okay. I think we're okay. Uh, Thanks. Okay, thank you. So there you are. Uh, that's that's what I was trying to say. Is that um, I'm sorry. I have. Uh, there must be a microphone on somewhere. Okay. So um, what I was trying to say is that in the sector where the charge is fixed, the uh, the physics is described by the semi classic configuration, and on top of that. You can write a, a very simple effective field theory, which is completely fixed by the requirement that the quantum theory is conformal. And again, the point is that even though the theory is strongly coupled, this is the O2 model, huh? there is no small coupling in the theory, you still have a way of computing in these sectors physical observables using perturbation theory. But today I'm not going to talk about this. What I want to do is to consider a system that is, well, that is at least accessible. So uh, one can discuss if it's strongly coupled or not, I'll say not, and try to justify my claims from, from first principles, to actually rederive these things without using effective field theory, and then show you how resurgence can be used for the large charge effective field theory to understand what's going on really. So in particular, I will concentrate on the ON model for large N, and what I will find is that there is an, a well-defined asymptotic expansion. And I show you why the expansion works also as more charge and compute all these coefficients that in the case of the O2 model, I have to actually fit on the lattice. Then what I will do is to use resurgence for <coughs> this theory and do a Borelli summation in double scaling limit when the charge goes to infinity and also n goes to infinity. And I do it there because that's where I have actual control over the theory. And you will see that there's going to be a natural geometric interpretation for the non perturbative effects. And this geometric interpretation will give me something that looks a lot like a general structure for the corrections for the effective field theory. And in the last slide, I will try to answer on this question of why did we pick two or three? Well, in the last is it just because it works. And in the last slide, I'm going to show you that it's very reasonable that two, three coefficients are the right place to, to break to get an optimal truncation. OK, so this is roughly the, the end of my introduction. So from now on, I'm going to be much more explicit. I'm going to show you formulas, and uh, I'll stop with the, with the pictures. Oh, oh, OK, once more. The first thing, I'm going to talk about what happens at large gen versus large charge. So as I said, uh, I'm concentrating on what we call the ON model, which is the, uh, the infrared fixed point of phi to the fourth. Okay. And we know that we want to study this thing on the cylinder so that computing the energies gives us directly conformal dimension. So what I'm considering is the phi to the fourth model for n complex fields on R cross some surface, which is S2, but can be anything. And uh, we finally tune the mass term here so that in infrared, we go to a conformal fixed point. And uh, we want to compute the partition function of fixed charge. In this case, there's a bunch of charges there's n of them. I pick one. And uh, OK, this is the way you write the charges in terms of these fields. So the object you want to compute is what you can call a canonical partition function, which is a trace. This guy here is the uh, charge operator. This guy here is a number. And uh, this is the grand canonical partition function. And the grand canonical partition function, you take a Fourier transform, you get the canonical partition function. And the log of this object is the free energy, which is the thing we want to compute. Now, uh, this trace here that contains a chemical, a chemical potentials for all these charges, you can rewrite in terms of a path integral. And you can do it in two ways, essentially. One is to add boundary conditions once you go the thermal circle. The second is to <clears throat> put not trivial boundary conditions, but add a flat connection to the action. So in particular, if you go the flat connection way, uh, you have a covariant derivative respect to time. 
Okay, so the chemical potentials appear, potential appears here. It's an imaginary chemical potential. And at this point, once you have this action here, you can just take the old books and just follow them. In particular, you can take the, I don't know, the review by Zinju Stone and Moshe Moshe and just go, which means that the first thing you do is want to get rid of the phi to the fourth. To do that, you introduce Lagrange multiplier, and then you can send u to infinity, and you get this effective action here, where now the fields, the fundamental fields appear quadratically, but you have a new field lambda. And then the idea is just that you expand this thing around some web for the fields and some webs for lambda as well. This is already in the limit u to infinity where the theory is uh, conformal, is infrared limit in this case. So you do this thing, the, field, uh, the fundamental fields phi appear quadratically, you can integrate them out, you get the trace log of this guy. And this, this comes from the web of the field. So this thing, now you can interpret as a non-local action for lambda. I want to stress this is, these are all uh, classical results. I mean, you find them in the books. There's no problem about that. But this is where the large N expansion comes about because then you want to expand this trace log in order by order in one over N. And if, from here, you can compute the free energy and the free energy is what then you identify via state operator correspondence with the conformal dimension. Okay. Now you take the limit beta to infinity and you have to regularize this trace log, uh, this determinant. And we do, for example, in zeta function. So we introduce the zeta function on the manifold, on the, um, you know, the, the sigma that we had, uh, that where we are putting the theory. Concretely, it will be the sphere at the end. And then we write gap equations, which means that we actually just uh, minimizing uh, this expression here with respect to M, with respect to A, and respect to theta, okay? So if we do that, we get these equations here. And uh, okay, you see there's a theta function that appears. This is something that you can control. There's no problem here. You can compute everything. And you find in particular that there is a relationship in this model between the expectation value of the Stratanovich field, so the, of the collective field that you have introduced to get rid of phi to the fourth, and the theta variable, which was the one that makes you pass from the grand canonical to the canonical ensemble. So you get these equations and you can solve them. And uh, you, know, you mix a bit the ingredients and what you find is that this M actually is a function of Q over N. So automatically from these equations here, you realize that the good parameter that appears in this problem is not N, is not Q, but it's Q over N, okay? So you turn the crank, you compute the free energy, again, in terms of this zeta function here, you put in the gap equations and you get this very simple formula. So what you find is that the free energy, which again, computed on the sphere will be the conformal dimension, it's given by this thing written in terms of a zeta function or some value of m. And this value of m is the one that solves the equation that is written here. Okay, so you have a, a couple system of equations and you can expand them in series, for example. You can expand them in large Q over n. We will see a little bit, we'll see in a moment that, that just a silly the width expansion. And uh, then you solve term by term. So when Q over n is large, you find that this f of Q will be given by this formula here. I, I'm coming back to this in a moment because in this particular problem, you don't need to fix Q over N to be large, but you can also use Q over N to be small. And you find another expansion for the conformal dimension, which is again, the free energy. And you see, this is something a little bit more familiar because when this is small, the theory is essentially perturbative around the free theory, which means that the leading order you get, a term, you get one half, which is the engineering dimension of the fundamental field phi, and then you get a bunch of corrections. And you can actually compute these corrections independently, just writing Feynman diagrams. And uh, Jack and Jones managed to get to order to five loops, I think here. And you can verify that term by term, this expansion here that you get just by expanding the zeta function just corresponds to, you know, exactly what you'd expect. This is, a one, this is a one loop result already. This is a two loops, these are three loops and so forth and so on. Okay. But now let me go back to the other extreme. Well, there's a big, a long story here, but not for today. 
Let me go out to the other extreme where Q over N is large, and that's what we find. Okay, so there's free energy. Again, it's conformal dimension. So what did we say from the effective theory? Well, we said that a leading order, there had to be something going like Q over N to the three halves. Subleading, there had to be one half, because it was one by one. Now, in our effective theory, the coefficients in front of these two things we could not access, but here we can compute. So a leading n, the first one is 4n over 3, the second is n over 3, and so forth and so on. I can compute everything. And if I play a little bit, well, I can observe that actually the, the numbers start going up. Okay, so this is clear, it's telling you that there is that this is an asymptotic expansion, and I'm going to discuss it very much in detail uh, in, in two slides or three. Another thing I wanted to stress is that uh, there, there is, uh, if you remember, in this formula I've written before, there was one number I could actually compute, this 0 0.093 so on. Uh, it's a quantum effect in effective theory, which is under control. We can find it also here. We have to do a slightly different computation, which is essentially, if you remember, I got here by integrating out all the fields. If you integrate them, all of them but one, well, you find also that uh, universal number. So that's a nice way of reproducing this prediction of the effective field theory, just from an explicit computation logic. Now, of course, you should ask, you, was, it all of, was all of this necessary, right? So I, I told you I have an effective theory, everything works. Why, why did I have to compute all this stuff? Well, because now, I, again, I can compare with lattice. Before I showed you what happens with the O2 model, this thing is supposed to be the ON model for large n. So now these coefficients here, I can actually compute, or at least I have the first term. And so what we did, again, is that we went to lattice people and asked them, OK, now that you've done the O2, uh, can you do the uh, O4, O6, O8, and so on? And uh, the, in fact, they did. <laughs> and this is what they found. So this dotted line here is just the leading term of large n. So this is the prediction for the O2 model, O4 model, O6 model, O8 model, or the first coefficient. And these are the results on the lattice. So it, of course, is not as great as before. Uh, here n should be large, and on the other hand, n is two. But, but you see, I mean, at least it seems reasonable. Same for the subleading term, seems extremely reasonable as well. OK, so now that we have the large n, the large n computation where everything is under control, that's a good moment to see what resurgence can do for us. So concretely, the question is, can we understand the structure of these terms that we have found explicitly one by one by doing a resurgence calculation? So let, let me just recap a moment. The, I have the O2N model at criticality in one plus two dimensions, so uh, on some manifold sigma. In the double scaling limit, n goes to infinity, q goes to infinity, and q over n is fixed. The quantity I'm interested in is this f sigma, which is actually a conformal dimension, and uh, it's a function of a zeta function computed. Oh, I called it m before, and it's called mu. But mu is simply the solution to this other equation. Now, if you have a little bit of an eye, you realize that what I've written here, and it shouldn't be surprising, is a Legendre transform. So in fact, f sigma is nothing else than the Legendre transform of this zeta function here. Uh, so this is a fancy way of writing a Legendre transform, but it's, it's all to say that the free energy of fixed charge is Legendre transform of what you'd call the grand potential in thermodynamics, which for this particular model can be computed in terms of the zeta function. Now, this zeta function is nothing else than a zeta function for the operator Laplace and plasma squared, which is nothing else than the, the Mellin transform of the heat kernel. When Q is large, also mu is large, but if mu is large here, it means that t has to be small, which means that this integral here will be dominated by small t. And this is nothing else than the classical Seeley de Witt problem. What I'm telling you is that in the large n case, the large charge expansion is literally the same thing as the expansion of the heat kernel for small t. So, as a warm up, which is actually interesting because of the physics, let me consider a sigma the torus. Okay, I, I really want the sphere, but let me start with the torus just because it's easy. 
Because in the case of the torus, the spectrum is particularly easy. The heat kernel is a theta function. And uh, since I'm interested in what happens at small t, I can just do a Poisson resummation and get this result, okay? So this is exact. It's the leading n result of the on model on the torus. That's it, okay? From here, I do a Mellin transform, I get this omega, and from there, I do a Legend transform, and finally, I get the free energy on the torus. Now, the free energy on the torus is not the conformal dimension, but it's close enough, at least in the form that we find. So what you see here is that you get a perturbative expansion, which, you know, it's a silly de Witt problem. It depends on the curvatures. On the torus, the curvature is zero, so the perturbative expansion has literally one term, which is the Q to the three halves. And then you have a series of, uh, literally a series of uh, non-perturbative terms, which are controlled by square e to the minus square root of Q. Okay, and this is just coming out from doing a Poisson resummation and uh, playing a little bit with Legend transforms. <coughs> Sorry. So you see, now we have a double expansion in the two parameters, one over Q. Well, granted here this liter in one term, but it, it is what it is. And and the other perturb the other perturbative parameter is e to the minus square root of four pi Q. Okay, and uh, so already you see that it's something a little bit special because it's not the usual e to the minus q that you would expect in a QFT, but it's something that is more reminiscent of a, of a matrix theory, really, because it's square root of q, so it's square root of the other uh, perturbative parameter. Now, this is what you should expect, but the thing that you really want to compute is the sphere, okay? Because the sphere gives you conformal dimensions. You can essentially play the same game, so you write explicitly uh, your partition, for your heat kernel, and then you do a Poisson resummation, and you get this form here. And, uh, well, you look at these terms, you see the Bernoulli numbers, and unsurprisingly, this thing here is divergent now. So in the case of the torus, there was essentially one term. Here, on the other hand, they have a divergent expansion, which diverges like, uh, like, diverges like n factorial. Okay, And as we all know, this is reflected into the existence of non-perturbative correction. Now, uh, we're talking, I mean, this is a meeting about resurgence, so I don't need to tell you all the story. The next thing to do is to ask Monsieur Borel what to do with it, right? And uh, Borel, of course, tells you, no problem, you just divide by the appropriate gamma function, then uh, you take a Laplace transform and you're gonna get something, okay? And uh, as we all know, there is this, step here that is tricky because what can happen, and in fact does happen in this particular problem, is that you might get poles on uh, the co integration contour. That's literally what happens here. But this is nice because uh, from our point of view, we, now that we know that there are the poles, we know, well, at least we have a handle on the non-perturbative effect that we expect. And remember, the torus already told us what to expect. So how do we study that? Well, the idea we all know is to add a little bit more ingredients to see how this non-perturbative stuff works. And uh, the idea is to rewrite the heat kernel just as a, as a path integral. So we will have the heat kernel for the sphere or in general manifolds. And this we can re understand as a free quantum particle moving on this surface. In this case, moving on the cylinder. Okay. so. What happens is that we just have to look at the geodesics, really at this helical, which would be geodesics on the sphere and moving up on the cylinder. So we have these helix, helices that go up and uh, the path integral will, uh, will naturally separate into a perturbative part and then a series of perturbative corrections each around each closed geodesic on the sphere or on the surface, sigma, whatever. The interesting thing is that this gives a, a geometric construction for this object. And this is geometric, our claim, or at least our expectation is that it's quite resistant and it should work not just for large gen, but it seems to be the good way of looking at this problem. So le let me again take the example of the torus, just like as a toy model. So in this case, we have to look at geodesics on the torus, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with points on the lattice. So you just, you know, th this blue line around the torus is nothing else than 
if you understand the torus in terms of this lattice here, will correspond to this line here, the red line here is this red line here, and so on. So it's a torus, so the free particle is literally free. It's just a quadratic action. You can compute the determinant, and you can rewrite your path integral. And surprise, surprise, you get exactly the same formula that we had before for Poisson resummation. OK? So this tells you that this interpretation, at least for the torus, reproduces everything. Now, we have to play the same game on the sphere. And in this case, there's something a little bit more interesting because you have the same kind of geodesics in the sense that you have the same fluctuations, but there are modes on, on the sphere which uh, there's a zero mode because you can take any geodesic and just turn it around. And there's also an unstable modes because you know you can just slip it off. You, you keep one point fixed and your geodesic will just go away, right? Which means that together with the fluctuations, you expect a zero mode and you expect instabilities. You can compute all these things. You can put them all together. And what you find is that at the end, the, uh, the sum over all the non-trivial geodesics takes this form that is written here. And this is beautiful because if you compute the ambiguities in Borel sum, these are perfectly canceled by this at one loop. You don't need to compute more than one loop for this thing. There's some sort of localization happening, and the one loop computation on the sphere completely cancels the terms in the Borel summation. Well, cancels the imaginary pieces, and you can write, a, a, well, a, a completely useless but funny way of writing exact expression for this ground potential, which can, can comp which you can compare finally with a small charge expansion, and you get the usual 12 digits of precision from uh, this object here, OK? But I don't want to stress this. There's something that, from my point of view, is actually more interesting. And it's related more to the idea of optimal truncation, OK? So remember, I, I really, what I have in mind is writing effective field theories, right? So I wrote this effective field theory, and generically, these coefficients are unknown, OK? Now, can we say anything about these coefficients now that we have this picture in mind of this being an asymptotic expansion and the non-perturbative effects related to these particles moving around the cylinder? OK, so the assumption is that this picture, this geometric picture, is robust enough that even though we found it a large n, is robust enough that tells you what happens also for any n. OK, so that's a big assumption. Concretely, I'm assi assuming that large charge expansion is asymptotic, as we have seen in large n, and that the leading pole in the Borel plane is a particle of mass mu going around the equator. Here comes something special. This is a CFT, OK? So it means that there are no intrinsic scales. On the other hand, I have a particle of mass mu going around the circle. So the, the mass of the particle is something dimension full, OK? But the, this, the theory does not contain anything dimension full. The only thing that is dimension full is the charge, the charge density, which means that the only way this can work is if this mass mu is precisely the charge density to the appropriate power, in this case, square root. OK, so this tells us the following, that the conformal dimensions will be a trans series with the starting at Q to three halves with one over Q, the things we've seen before. Then there's going to be a non perturbative piece. However, the fact that the mass has to be mu and mu goes like square root of Q tells us that the non perturbative part must be controlled by square root of q. You see, this comes from CFT now. It's not the result of a calculation. It's the fact that there are no other dimensionful objects in the theory. Moreover, this it's not just square root of q, but this has to be precisely the charge density. But the charge density you compute with the perturbative part, with the leading one, actually. So it means that not only I know that this has to be like square root of q, but the coefficient in front of square root of q, apart from the factors of 2 pi and so on, has to be fixed by the leading coefficient here, because it's the leading coefficient here that tells you how mu is made. Okay? 
So you have an inter you don't have just the usual interplay that you know these terms and then you can say things about next ones, but it works a little bit both ways. You see, the controlling parameter for the non-perturbative non effect is fixed by the leading term now in the one over Q expansion. On the other hand, the fact that the non-perturbative correction goes like e to the minus square root of Q tells you that all these terms that you don't know because the effective theory does never tell you the coefficients in front of the terms, actually, in order for this to be consistent, they must diverge and they must diverge like two n factorial and the two it's because there's a square root here. Okay, so you, you really have these two things that because this is not a, a generic theory, this is a very special theory, it's a CFT and this means there are no scales. And then altogether, this means that the perturbative and non-perturbative part have to see each other because otherwise the theory wouldn't be consistent, okay? So the first thing you can do looking at this is to estimate for the generic now theory, not just for large gen, what is the optimal truncation? So how many terms you actually need? Right, that's what Andy was asking before. And uh, well, in this case, what you find is that the number of terms has to go like square root of Q with a coefficient here, which is essentially fixed by the first term in the perturbative expansion. And the corresponding or uh, error has to be, of, must go like E to the minus square root of Q. And you see in the O2 model where we did have the results on the lattice, we can compute this coefficient just by well, compute, we just, fit them and we find that the coefficient that appeared there is roughly one third so that n star so the optimal truncation is at order square root of q and the error that you make is order e to the minus pi square root of q okay so let's see on the lattice i said the best fit with with three terms two to three terms depends how you like uh, you like your statistics a key equal to one here the error between the line, the expectation, and the actual measurement is of the order 10 to the minus two. A Q equal to 11, the error is order 10 to the minus five. And what does resurgence tell us? Well, with my assumption, namely the fact that the leading contribution to the non perturbative effect comes from this particle going around, tells us that the optimal truncation is at square root of Q, which for 10 is three-ish. And the error that you make is of the order of e to the minus pi square root of q, which for one is 10 to the minus two, and for 11 is 10 to the minus five. And I'm not claiming that this is a computation, but I just would like you to observe that the thing we see on the lattice and the things we see from resurgence are incredibly close. Okay, so let me just recap a moment. What has happened here is that the large charge expansion is asymptotic in the large n limit. And this double scaling limit, we can control the perturbative expansion, but rarely sum it. And as far as I'm concerned, the most interesting thing is that there's a geometric interpretation, which we push to the finite n case, at least saying that, you know, the idea is that this picture at least is robust enough. And in this way, we obtain some optimal truncation, estimation of the error, which seems to be in a very good agreement with the lattice simulation. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I convinced you that this large charge approach can be used to study strongly coupled systems in a perturbative way. Uh, sector by sector, we have a controllable effective field theory where the strongly coupled physics, again, is subsumed by some semi-classical states. And from there, I can get precise and testable prediction. However, if the theory is controllable independently, here I've discussed large n, it could have been four minus epsilon, there's a lot to work on that, for example, then we also can have some quantitative slash qualitative control of the non-perturbative effect. And the fact that we are discussing a CFT, and this is crucial because it's very, well, you know, CFTs have a lot of symmetry, so they have a lot of constraints. Well, it tells us that in this particular case, there seems to be more of the usual perturbative, non-perturbative interplay. And from there, we can actually make more predictions about the, uh, the errors made by the expansion. And in this particular case of the O2 model, which again is very complicated if you want to try to do it explicitly. We found a remarkable agreement with the lattice results. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
Thanks, Domenico. My pleasure. Questions? Hi. Um, Hi. You had an argument based on scaling that explained why the mass of the particle had to be proportional to the square root of Q. Right. But that I understood, but then you said something stronger. You said you can even say the exact coefficient, and I couldn't understand why. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. I, I can and I can't. So uh, the, the argument is it, it, it just dimensions, right? However, mu is a, is a precise value. So it's uh, the relationship between mu, the charge density, and Q, the charge. Well, mu is not exactly that. OK, no, I'm sorry. I have to be a little bit more precise to explain where, I, where I'm coming from. So uh, I have to go to the effective field theory. So that mu there is this. When you write the effective field theory, uh, you want a, a fixed charge, well, you want to cite a fixed charge, and fixed charge for the Goldstone field here means that the Goldstone in the lower state is mu t. So mu is literally the coefficient of the time for the Goldstone here. And uh, if you fix the charge, mu is not independent from the charge, but it can be computed using the k3 half term. Well, it's an expansion itself, but the leading term of mu comes from k to the 3 halves. So what I'm saying is that mu is fixed by q and k to the 3 halves. Now, generically, uh, you, would you would say that, uh, how do you know that this is the right thing to put in there, right? We have some reasons to believe that this is literally it. Um, in principle, there could have been another coefficient in front, but the other coefficient in front can only be of order one. Because in a generic theory, in a generic a strongly coupled theory, there's nothing small, nothing big, so everything is order one. So a, a, a little bit of a, let, let me put it like this. The, the, the more precise claim is weaker, and it just it goes like square root of Q. The, uh, the bit stronger claim is that it, it's one times a coefficient that can be computed from this guy. And this guy can get on the lattice. Does this answer your question? Uh, I think so, thank you. Okay, thank you. Dan Daniela. Do you have an interpretation of the exponentially suppressed corrections also from the sigma model point of view? Is there a finite action configuration that has that action? So uh, these are, from, fr from my point of view, these are finite action configurations because these are literally massive particles going around the cylinder. Now, uh, in the, uh, the only way, well, at least, as far as I am concerned, the only model where I can access them is this large end story. And uh, in this large end story, again, it's, literally the fact that a leading end you end up computing a heat kernel and then heat kernel you understand the quantum particle and that's it but i don't have more than that okay anybody else okay maybe i'll ask a question if you go to a general riemann surface instead of the sphere does something interesting happen I don't know. Well, yes. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Uh, the, the, the things that we looked at were the torus, because it was the simplest, and uh, the sphere, because uh, using state operator correspondence, then uh, you get directly conformal dimensions. Now, uh, you can ask what happens for, for, more, for other Riemann surfaces. Um, the, from the point of view of the CFT, I think that the most interesting surface is the sphere, just because the state operator. However, uh, something that would be interesting has not been explored at all is what happens when you, uh, well, uh, you, you relax the condition of uh, being conformal. And in that case, everything might, would be much more interesting because then uh, these things are not related to each other and this should give you more information about the theory. But this is beyond what we've done.
Okay, well, let's thank Domenico again, and thank you, okay. Domenico, for taking such trouble for the talk. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.